So I'm going to talk about encouraging change, changes hopefully that people want to make themselves using M Health, uh, but doing so in a way that really is getting smarter about emotion. So, and, um, and helping you know, the technology be emotionally intelligent, helping people become more emotionally intelligent about how they make changes in their lives. I think everyone, probably everyone in this room, I think mostly everyone in the world is sort of agreeing and recognizing the potential for mobile technologies, particularly our phones, to really change healthcare, to really disseminate uh, interventions in a way that is, is game changing. And that's because um, they can scale, so they can reach far more people than have access today, particularly to things like mental health, which are very expensive. They, sorry, okay. Um, they're contextually sensitive. So the, the message that you get when you're at the grocery store is different than the message that you get when you are on the highway. The message that you get with your mom is different than when you're hanging out at work. Um, or the message that you get when you're stressed out is different than the message that you get when you wake up in the morning. And, and finally, mobile, you know, mobile technologies it has so much other data on it, your music, your, your friends, your, your songs, that you can integrate all sorts of health, health interventions with all the media that you love, making it far more personal and amenable to the kind of appropriation and internalization of health interventions that really is necessary for people to make changes and to feel like those are changes that they want to make. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, okay. So, uh, in order to do this, though, in order for change to stick over the long, uh, long haul and make a dent in chronic disease, I think we need to be smarter about addressing the emotional and social factors. And we all talk about it, like, oh, motivation is emotional. But, but I don't really see a lot being done on that front. And, and part of what I do as a psychologist and ethnographer is interview people about, uh, about their health, about their life aspirations, their values, and what gets in the way, like in the day-to-day, moment-to-moment, um, why does that not align with, our lo with the long-term aspirations and goals that people set? What are the, what are the ways in which there are disconnects and, and how can we help people resolve them? And sort of challenge myself, challenge all of us to think carefully about how can we um, address these psychological dynamics, integrating them with the emerging technology capabilities in new ways, right? Like, and we don't just have to rely on the, the relatively stale health, health psychology techniques we can borrow from, behavioral economics, and newer trends in psychotherapy, um, and as well as you know, things from social learning that have never quite found their way into to health psychology, and also ethnography. I mean, we, we learn a lot about the ways that people live, the ways that they use technology in daily life by going in and observing them there, and that's going to inform how we translate clinical practice into technologies. So that, you know, the capabilities that are now on all of our phones are, you know, data mining, location awareness, social networking, and, you know, really good interaction design, um, or it affords that. So these are all things that we should be exploring. Um, so what I want to do is just walk through, I've been, you know, mining, uh, reviewing a lot of psychology literature and combining that with, um, you know, technology and design, and, and came up with seven guidelines that um, are, are guiding some of my work, and I'll, sh I'll show you examples of those, and, and just walk through them pretty, you know, pretty quickly. Um, as I, okay, so the first one really picks up on, on Vic's talk, you know, remind people of who they want to be. So not, not who you want them to be, but who, but who, who they want to be. And there's a lot of research from social psychology on commitment and consistency. So people don't like cognitive dissonance. We don't like saying, um, I believe in exercise, and then not seeing ourselves not exercise, or um, I believe in voting and, and acknowledging to someone, I, I didn't vote today. Uh, that people will go to, you know, go to great effort to avoid that kind of dissonance. And um, one way that I've been thinking, in, in acceptance and commitment therapy is um, kind of a cool thread of cognitive therapy that, that really calls out, asks people about their values and tries to uh, you know, align those with the micro behaviors in, in daily life. And one thing that I've been working on is um, applications that, um, some of which run on, on products by uh, Care Innovations, an Intel GE spin-out company called the Health Guide, and some of um, them are mobile applications like the one you see here. But what this does is, is you see a juxtaposition of this, this arduous, kind of tedious daily behavior of medication reminding with a, a bigger life 
um, value or pursuit of gardening so that you know, people can sort of couple those. And whether you call that Skinnerian or sort of value-oriented therapy, it's a way to do it that's visual, instantaneous, and might, might work. Don't know, haven't tested it, but, um, but it could. I think I'll, I'll use that example there. Um, the second principle, foster an alliance. We know in psychotherapy, you know, loads of meta-analyses to show that the bond between the therapist and the patient is a strong predictor of, of how, how effective the therapy will be and how, whether someone even stays in the therapy. And, um, and that, that bond is something that people also experience with their devices. We know from recent neuroimaging studies, and, and it's patently obvious when you go into an Apple store that people love their phones and you know, describe these near-death experiences when they, when they lose them. So there's, that's, there are some ways in which that's problematic, right? When, when you love your phone instead of people, or, um, and that you know, is something that certainly is getting a lot of, a lot of attention by commentaries, you know, and I, I think that that's all valid. But we can, we can take this bond and, and build on it for the sake of encouraging change. And there are ways to do this that um, are pretty simple, that good therapists do. You, you express empathy. Um, you get to know the person and tailor the treatment in interesting ways. You get to know the, their situations, their hang-ups, and you don't offer the same, uh, the same thing to everyone. And, um, and collaborative problem solving. So there's simple ways just in the language that's on an application to have a let's rather than you do this. And, and there's, I mean, there's very tip of the iceberg ways in which a, an alliance can be built, but I think it's important to always keep that in mind. Um, third is using social influence. Um, we know from research on, again, mostly from social psychology, that social norms, our ideas of what other people are doing, particularly if there are other people we uh, admire or people who, but we think are kind of like us, will will do those same things, and whether that's you know there are some classic studies on whether we'll reuse towels in hotel rooms if we're told that other people do, or if we will take our trash out of parks if we're told that other people do that sort of thing, but you know marketers use this, Amazon uses this, Netflix uses this, but health messaging uh, not so good. Often we see things like on the left. So this is uh, from an obesity campaign. More than 9 million children are obese. It's like a TV commercial. So what happens if you read this and you're a parent whose kid is overweight or you're overweight and you're a teenager? You think, I'm normal. It's OK. And what we should be doing are things that are, this is a concept I've been playing with, of you know, taking, finding a social norm using data mining. 80% uh, of ten, teens play kids up, play sports after school. You can probably find a statistic that is accurate. Um, give it to someone in a timely way and also combine it with you know, knowing where they are and where their friends are. And uh, that turns it into a pretty actionable nudge. Fourth, show people what they'll lose. Uh, we know from behavioral economics that the threat of loss is often a far more powerful incentive than the promise of a reward. The problem with health is that what you'll lose is often so abstract. I'm going to lose my well-being. I'm going to lose my mobility. Or you know, what does this mean? It's not palpable enough. So again, using this um, on this product called the Health Guide, I've been you know, showing how to give feed, illustrating different ways we can use it to give feedback. So if we take this is a woman with heart failure, you know, uploading her blood pressure and all these other things, um, telling it what she's eaten, and here the visuals are, are trying to indicate that if you and, and it's presuming she said she ate salt. So if you continue that, you might go from being able to walk or you know, run, possibly, um, to experiencing, uh, to cycling down into swollen ankles and this sort of rehab situation if there's decompensation. So illustrating to people through images what should be a familiar path um, of loss. Another way that I've been playing around with that is um, in Facebook, where you're know, showing people a potential loss of social capital. If, and th this is an application I built with two colleagues, uh, Muki hansen Zora from Intel and Joan Severson from Cognitive Media. And it's called With a Little Help from My Friends. It's a Firefox add-on. And you set a health goal. And uh, if you don't log on and say, I did my health goal. I think mine was going for a walk every day or something. And you can see your friends start to fade away. 
and their, their posts are blocked, and you, you have to get back on track with your goal to, to regain access. So uh, it's another way to show loss in a way that's different than monetary loss or trophies or something. Um, five, put the message where the action is. You know, there's, the closer a prompt is to the situation, the salient situation, the more likely it is to be followed. So we can think about uh, where the action is in terms of you know, uh, time or place and many other ways. I think we're still, we're still kind of in the era of time-based prompting. I mean, even Vitality, you know, glow caps, it's kind of a, you get, you get the reminder at the time you're supposed to take the medication. And that's it's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty cool product. And I, I think that it probably will find its way into mobile phones with work with the regu, you know, FDA. But, but it's, there are many behaviors which aren't strictly timed, right? And that's what makes life interesting and what makes health kind of challenging. So where location is just one of many other um, situational factors, but uh, I don't see a lot of really good health interventions that are based on location. We have some things that happen when we get into our cars. It says put on a seatbelt, but um, this is a product. I, th I just put it up here for kind of aspiration. It's this product called Light Cubes. I, they've, it's been featured on like CSI and some, um, some uh, substance abuse um, Researchers have used it, so they put this these these cues, which look sort of like police cars sirens in in drinks and bars, and see um, is that more effective when, than a billboard, say on a subway that says uh, don't drink and drive, right? So if you put this sort of visual cue of a threat in the situation, that's going to hopefully be or one would think would probably be a lot more provocative than a billboard that's totally removed from context. I don't know of an, an app or a, a real uh, technological equivalent of this, but I think it's something to shoot for. Um, these last two rules I put together because I'll um, is sort of one project that I'll use as an example, but raise emotional awareness and help people reframe or reappraise situations that um, that uh, are linked with either acting in accordance or violating health goals. So this is a project um, called Mobile Heart Health that I did at Intel with colleagues and worked with um, some colleagues at Columbia on. And uh, I'll, I think I'll just launch into a different uh, presentation to, to show that. So it's, the idea initially was you had a, a sensor that would know if you were stressed and your phone would come alive as a psychologist to offer you some help in the situations like that. It's that momentary assessment, or in this case, continuous assessment, um, just-in-time feedback. Let me do, 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 do. shift tab, uh, control. Okay. All right, so. So this, uh, what I'm going to show you here are just some of the interfaces. And the, part of the reason I show this is that cognitive therapy, I think, is so amenable to um, innovative phone apps because it, it hinges on uh, checking in with yourself throughout the day, in-situ exercises, like practice this strategy when you're in this situation. And so your phone is always with you, and you know it's a good match. So um, and this, a lot of these interfaces are showing how do you help people check in with themselves throughout the day. So this is an, something of the mood map. There's now, you can find this on my iPhone and Android, this, this one component. Um, but it, it asks you how you're doing using the circumplex model of emotion. And uh, what we would do is show people visualizations of their mood, trying to use the same map to show uh, mood as a function of, of place and uh, social context and diet and help people just kind of get curious about what these relationships are. Um, and in the moment, people, there are a lot of different interventions. One that you just saw, there was just images from the phone. Some were uh, as simple as, you know, a breathing exercise. And this sort of slowly expands and contracts and, you know, in early prototypes was, was linked with this ECG. Um, and some were a little bit more complicated. How do you help people when they say they're, they're angry 
or in feeling annoyed with someone? How do you help them think about things in a more empathic way? Or if someone's, you know, this is, sorry, this, uh, someone says they're really getting angry or annoyed. We also involved in these flows of interventions, uh, questions that encourage cognitive reappraisal. So is there a different way to think about a situation? This is trying to translate some of what a the way a cognitive therapist would talk to, you know, what, what people might expect to see on their phones. So let's see here. I'm going to go back to this other presentation. Um, and I guess what, you know, what I wanted to say about the whole cognitive therapy thing is that do, 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 is that you know cognitive therapy? It's important for mental health, of course, and you know all sorts of problems that are directly associated with mental health, whether it's you know stressful eating or stress stressed eating, but also just I mean it's tip. I think we're starting to see cognitive therapy applied to you know smoking cessation, as you know Alir said this morning, um, to overeating or just you know obviously there's a lot of comorbidity with um, other problems. So I think cognitive therapy has much broader applications beyond just stress stress management or depression. I've also been exploring this issue of how to help people reframe and check in with themselves emotionally on uh, Twitter. This is just something like spell check, but uh, you know, underlines in red your negative words and in green your, your positive words. And again, it's just a moment in the situation that matters to help people check in and consider different ways of expressing themselves. So to conclude, you know, I think to reach this promise of, of M Health for um, far greater access to, um, to really interesting uh, interventions and, and make those more relevant by being contextually aware and, and encourage autonomy in the way that people proceed, I think we, we do need to think like psychologists of 2011. We need to rethink these interventions that we've used in the clinic, but combine them in creative ways with, uh, with the technology capabilities on mobile phones. And also to realize that the way people use their mobile phones is different than the way they go into a clinic. So that's it. I'm going to take any questions.